but the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes were written by two different King Solomons. The book of Proverbs was written throughout the prosperous years of Solomon's life when he loved the Lord, when he lived for the Lord. The book of Proverbs was written from a perspective of someone who loved God and wanted to instruct and admonish not only his children, but also the children of Israel to develop such a love and fall in love with God and the things of God. It was a book of warning. The book of Ecclesiastes, on the other hand, when I read it, I get the perspective of an elderly man who doesn't even want credit. You'll find that throughout the entire book, he refers to himself as the preacher, which is what Ecclesiastes means. He doesn't want credit, but he also doesn't want people to know necessarily who wrote the book. Well, why would you say that, Brother Jordan? Because in Solomon's old age, because of his love for things other than God, we won't get into all of what it was, but... In Solomon's old days, the wisest man to ever live bowed down and worshiped false gods. Now, how can the same person who wrote the book of Proverbs, who talks about loving the law of the Lord and making it your priority in life, not to stray from the path of God, how can that guy, who was the smartest guy to ever live, how could that guy bow down and worship false gods in his old age? When I read the book of Ecclesiastes, I read it of a man who knows that he's done wrong and he wants to keep others from going down the same path that he did. I've heard people say that this is a depressed Solomon. Well, he may have been, but he's not writing this for depression's sake. He's writing it to show everybody else, don't tread the path that I tread. It's a remorseful Solomon. Solomon still knows that God's in control. Go read the last chapter of this book. Right, Solomon still knows who's in control, but then why did he do the things that he did? That, that's a whole different story. But each chapter, you get a little bit of glimpse into how Solomon ended up where he eventually found himself. And he recounts to the reader, hey, I looked at this and vanity. There's no value in it. Vanity of vanity is all is vanity. But this is even more worthless than Vanity. It says, vanity of vanities. But in this chapter, he shows something in these verses that we read that is vanity. It's emptiness. It's worthless. It doesn't have any value to your life. And then he shows you something that actually does have merit. That does make a difference, not on this side of life, but on eternity side. Beginning in verse number 11. It says, when goods increase. What are goods, Brother Jordan? It can be anything. Goods can be food. Goods can be things. Goods can be money. But whatever it is, you're going to find out. Because according to Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, he searched all of the earth, all the workings of man's hands. God blessed Solomon so much that Solomon had so much free time that he could go around and be busy or concern himself with whatever he wanted to concern himself with. God had blessed Israel with peace. Right? God made a way that other kings came down and bowed to Solomon out of reverence to him. Everybody wanted to be allies with Israel instead of enemies. God finally allowed the house of the Lord, the temple of Solomon, to be built. Right? Israel spiritually was doing great, so what did Solomon do? He started looking. He says, why do people do that? And he wanted to find out why. And why aren't people happy with the things that God gives them? And he went and he sought it out, and he found out why. And in all of the searching, he says, it doesn't matter what kind of good it is. Right? Goods are called goods. Why? Because they can do you good. Right? They don't call them harms. Okay? You go down to the grocery store, it doesn't say that we've got, you know, we got harms, and then we got, you know, uh, what are them things? The things that cause cancer. Carcinogens. We don't have harms and carcinogens in the, in the Kroger, right? We've got goods, and then what are other things that people will labor for? Services. Something you can't do for yourself. Okay, but goods can do you good. But if you like Brother Jordan, and you like certain goods too much, then you get fat because you ate too much goods. 
At that point, it becomes a harm. But there's blessing and cursing and everything. The goods aren't the problem. But he says when goods increase, increase isn't the problem. God doesn't want you to be poor and destitute and wondering where your next meal is going to come from. No, he promised you from the word of God that all your needs would be met. He told you having food and raiment to be content therewith. But it's God's will that you be blessed and that you live a victorious Christian life. God doesn't want God's people fretting over where everything's going to be coming from next. Right? If God was against prosperity, why did Israel walk out with all the riches of Egypt when he set them free from captivity? God's not against goods. God's not against increase. What's God against? Well, it says when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof save the beholding of them with their eyes? There's a whole lot of things in this world you can spend money on. But you can get to a point where if you achieve a certain level of success, spending money don't bring joy. Spending money doesn't satisfy. When goods increase, you're going to find that there's a lot of people that show up out of nowhere that want a piece of your increase. Some of them may be sincere. Some of them may be well-intentioned. Right? Don't look down your nose at some. Hey, if you know where a good time's happening, you'd be stupid not to try and get in on it. Right? Hey, I'm having a cookout. I'm paying for everything. Well, if you know that it's available, right? we're Baptist, all right? You say free food, everybody and their sister's going to show up. Right? Whether you know their relative or not, they're coming too. Why? Because four words, or four letters, free. But when goods increase, right, people want to be around success. People want to be around prosperity. But right? if a man wants to have friends, he must show himself friendly. Right? But if you want to be Eeyore in the corner, that's the best way to be by yourself. Right? Throw a pity party. One may be the loneliest number, but some people seem set on being the only one at their pity party. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? When there's increase, people flock to it. You don't believe me? Go look at American history. You ever heard of a boom town? What happened? Somebody said, hey, there's gold in the dirt. What happened? Everybody showed up. And in most of them nowadays are ghost towns. Why? Because the gold went away and so did the people. They found all that they could find and they said, well, there's no sense in being out here. Solomon's saying, your life can be like a boom town. Goods are good for you. But at a certain point, you don't need them anymore. Right? Anybody be able to raise their hand and say that God's blessed you, pressed down, shaking, bubbling over more than you can handle this morning? That you've got more than you need? You've got your wants too? We're talking about above that. Solomon said that there was everything that he could imagine. He went out and either got it, or he went out and he did it. But Solomon was so blessed that he couldn't even invent something that he wanted to go out and do it. He had tried it all. That's the lighter part of the verse. It says, And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? I can only eat so much food in a day, Brother Tony. It's a whole lot more than other people, but I can only eat so much food in a day. You can only drive so many cars in a day. You can only shop at so many stores in a day, even online. Eventually, you're going to run out of time. Goods are not meant to fill up your time. Goods, and the purpose of goods, is to free up your time to do what God would want you to do. At a certain point, you're not desiring it because you need it or because you even want it. You just want more. Like if I had time, we'd read this whole chapter today. What Solomon goes on to state in this chapter is that there's a hole deep down on the inside of man 
after he fell to sin. Right, the book of Proverbs says that some men right, are wells that can't be filled. Right, Jesus said that you know, there were painted cisterns, or painted sepulchers, and there were cisterns that could hold no water. Right? They were desiring something, but whatever they put in, it didn't satisfy, it didn't hold. That's all that the world is centered around. What did the devil promise Eve? Something that she could never get, something that she could never obtain, and something that wasn't as good as what she already had. He said, you shall be as gods, lowercase g, knowing the difference between good and evil. Well, on paper, it sounds pretty good to desire to be like God. Are we not instructed to be Christ-like? But what they wanted to do was be equal with God. That desire could never have been met. But when man fell to sin and man's soul became condemned to hell, fellowship with the Father was cut off with our very Creator. And man goes around in his natural state trying to dream up things and invent things and create aspirations that will satisfy that hole deep down in their soul. But no matter how much they pour in it, it never holds a drop of it. Solomon's saying, you get to a point, you don't need it anymore. You couldn't even partake in it. You've got so much that you'll never even spend what it is that you're laboring for right now. So why do you desire to have it? But man has that subconscious thing that when they lay their head down on their pillow at night, they know that they're not enough. And they hope that through things and through goods, they can become enough. They can satisfy themselves. Some people realize that it's not in possessions. They attain for status or a position, a title. They want the approval of other people. But guess what all those people find out? It doesn't matter how many people are clapping for you in the audience, you can't take it home with you. You can't bottle that feeling up and hang on to it for all of your life. Right? I learned that real early. You say, why, Brother Jordan? Those of you who know that I had, a, I had a debate history. At a certain point, I didn't want to go do all the high school tournaments around here anymore. Why? They had small trophies. Their trophies were made out of plastic. I wanted to go and travel to all the big tournaments around the country. Why? Because they got big trophies. And they're not made out of plastic. I've got one trophy that's probably bigger than Joseph still to this day from one of the national tournaments. They gave you plates that were made out of silver that had things engraved in them. That, that one was from Harvard. What do you say? They's uppity. Right? They's weird up there. They talk weird, drove weird. Not, not a good place, okay? But, on the other hand, what are you saying? At a certain point, the things that used to mean something to you don't mean anything anymore. Not used to, you took pride in it. Well, why do you think pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall? Because when you take satisfaction from the feeling of being better than somebody else, having more than somebody else, there's always another horse in the race that's going to pass you. And when you perceive that somebody has more than you, you're going to kill yourself or destroy yourself trying to outdo them. Pride's a lose-lose game. Because you may be as big as you want to be in your eyes, God's got a real good way of humbling you. And you've got to make the choice. Do I want more things or do I want more of Him? Because once He humbles you, you've still got to make the decision to repent. Well, what's it say about goods? Eventually you get to a point. The only point in having it is just so that you can look at it. Right? A lot of the things that people lay before, they're not worth looking at. They see something beautiful in it. But eventually it's going to fade off. Well, how do you know that? Because once they get it, they still labor. They still work. They still consume themselves with other things. So if the only point of having it is because it looks nice... Right, stop right there. What good is it going to do you to your life? What benefit is it going to bring to you if you can't come up with an answer? Well, I just want one. Right? I've been there. 
I'm talking to a grown adult who has multiple functioning lightsabers. I do not need those. They look real good on a shelf, though. Right? Well, why'd you get those? Because I'd like custom design those. Nobody else has one like that. That's mine. You can't have it. Right? You can't even touch it. You can look at it, but you can't touch it. Right? Brother Jordan went to the Caribbean to a museum because, yes, leave it to me that in the Caribbean on a cruise, I'll find a Star Wars gift shop on the middle of a Caribbean island, okay? But it was a guy who worked on the original movies, okay? He had original pages of the original scripts. Guess who owns one? Me. Can you see it? No. If it was up to me, it'd be behind, be behind bulletproof glass and like one of them concrete vaults that goes down in the floor. Do you need that, Brother Jordan? No. Do you put it on display for other people? No. That was an investment, and one day I will sell it and make profit. Okay? That's probably a lie, but right now that's still the intention. <laughs> but what do you say, Brother Jordan? Silly examples. But you have people stake their lives to go out and do something, to go to a place. Why? Because they think that it's going to change them. It's going to make an impact on them. Only to find that their grains of sand that once you have it, it's already through your fingertips. The beach is a beautiful place. But if you like me, humidity. God built me like a polar bear. You all have heard me say that before. I do good in cold, dry environments. Okay? That's why my birthday is one of my favorite days of the year. Not because it's the day that I was born on that year. It's because my birthday is usually the end of summer. Hallelujah. It's getting colder. But what are you saying, Brother Joe? There are things that you can only see the Grand Canyon so many times before the impact starts wearing off on you. Until what once meant something to you, what once you saw beauty in, now it's faded away. Has it changed? No, you've changed. Because you thought that it would satisfy, but you have found out you're still the same after you got it. After you experienced it. We're going somewhere. Hang on. Verse number 12. It says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. Now that labor, when it comes to the Bible, y'all have heard me say this before, the works of man... Right In the New Testament, we're used to thinking of that as man's works of self-righteousness. Right? That is not what the word labor means. Okay, Work and labor, two different words. That's why God used two different words in the Bible. Okay, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. What's that? That's talking about man's works of righteousness. Working to obtain favor with God. That's not what labor means. Labor means... That's the effort that you expend to live. To labor is to invest what God's given you, either through strength or intellect or through ability or capability, that you are investing that time. Why? So that you get what you need to survive out of it. Well, Brother Jordan, God promised that He'd provide all of our needs. Yeah, and some of y'all, He gave you a brain so that you could get a certain job to go out and have all of your needs met. Other people, they gave you a physique that you can go out and you can labor with your hands, you can labor with your back, with your muscles, so that you can have your needs met. Other people, they gave you a spirit of understanding, right, and sympathy so that you can counsel other people to have your needs met, or you can instruct other people to have your needs met. What are you saying? God promised to meet all your needs, but God also promised that if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. That if a man doesn't provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. Now, if you're laboring just as God's instructed you to do and somebody does you wrong, he may send ravens by with a whole meal for you. Right? But if you're not laboring, what's that mean? It means that you're taking for granted what God has blessed you with and you want a free ride. But we don't have time to get into all of that. But labor means that you're going out and you're trying to do what God's given you the capability and the ability to do. And you're going out and you're trying to use what God gave you
to make a difference in the world. So many times Jesus talked about when it came to, I mean, he told slaves to be the best slaves of their masters that they could be. But did God want them to be free? Well, it's God's desire that if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. But he also knew that the world's full of wicked and sinful men. And that some men desired the domination of others. This will really throw you for a loop. There were saved people that owned slaves. Go read what the Apostle Paul said about Onesimus, who was a slave to Philemon. And the Apostle Paul said, if he owes you anything, if he's done you any wrong, put it on my account. Treat him not as a slave, treat him as a brother. God had a whole lot to say about a whole lot of things that people don't want to pay attention to. But when it comes to witnessing, you know what it was? Whether you find yourself in prison shackles like the Apostle Paul, whether you find yourself as a ruler of the synagogue that came to the saving knowledge of Christ and you've got to turn your back on everything you've ever known, you're going to be ostracized from society. Or whether you're one of Caesar's very household, the elite of the elite. He said, go out and into the world. Why? Because where do you think you're going to find what God has provided for you in the world? Did Israel find the promised land in Egypt? No, they had to make it to Canaan land. And once they got there, what did they have to do? They had to go and possess it. They had to go follow God's instructions and take it. What was that? That was labor. That was doing what they could and trusting that God would do the rest. But it says if you go out and you labor all day long, it don't matter if you had you know, one biscuit with some gravy on it or if you had a whole feast that was laid out for you. The sleep is good. It's not about the food, it's about the rest. Somebody that labors doesn't necessarily desire a four-course meal when they get done laboring out. The last thing I wanted to do after a football game or football practice was go out and eat a whole lot of food. I wanted to sit down and do nothing in air conditioning. Right? I wanted rest. The last thing that you can do after you've just run a marathon is sit down and eat a whole lot of food. Your body won't accept it. Right? He's saying the people that go out and work all day that you look at them and you think, well, that guy, that guy did a hard day's work today. That guy earned his paycheck today. You know what that guy desires? He just desires rest. He's gone out and he's given everything that he can, and he just wants to be able to recuperate so that he can go back out tomorrow and do the same thing. Well, doesn't the Bible tell us that our labor for the Lord is not in vain? God doesn't want you to work on Christ's behalf. He wants you to labor on Christ's behalf. We'll come back to that. But it says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Regardless of how much he ate when he got home, regardless of what he's got in his pocket when he gets home, regardless of what he drove in on or he drove out in, his sleep is sweet. It is a respite. It is an oasis. That he enjoys it. But yet, you find that the more you get in the latter point, the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Anybody ever heard this phrase? More money, more problems? Man didn't come up with that. God knew that from the beginning. Why do you think people get so excited when they hear little as much when God is in it? Because if you give over all the much to God and the abundance... And the pursuit of everything, if you will crucify that part of your flesh, you'll find it don't take much for you to be able to lay your head down on your pillow at night and have peace with God. The man's labor makes his rest sweet. Makes his sleep sweet. The rich man only gets more problems with the more things that he has. Right? And to a point, you can bear it. But at a certain point, 
Why do you think all these rich people nowadays, they don't actually take care of their own money and all their stuff. They hire property managers. They hire financial accounts. Why? Because they found out if they try to take care of all of it, they got no peace in their life. And why do you think those guys get paid so much money? Because they're taking a whole lot of stress and a whole lot of hassle off of the people that just want to enjoy life. They don't want all the problems. They just want all of the abundance. But as the world waxes worse and worse, people have found a way to get away from that. Back in the day, if you used a heady household, you had to take care of all the business. Because that was your responsibility. Somebody wasn't going to do it for you. You had to do it for yourself. And there were guys going crazy. Anybody ever heard of gold lust? Somebody just wants gold so much, literally in those boom towns that we talked about. People thought that that gold was the problem to, or the solution to all their problems. They would literally kill men over a hunk of metal that came out of the ground. Why? Because they had gotten themselves to a mental state that they thought all their hope was in that gold. The man that labors realized that his hope is not in what he can do with his hands. His hope is not what he's going to get rewarded with for his labor. His hope is not in anything that can be bought. Right? His hope is in the labor that he does. We'll come back to that too. But it says, the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. It means whether you're asleep, you know what you're dreaming about, your problems. When you're awake, you know what's on your mind, all of your problems. When you go out and you're having lunch with a friend to catch up, you know what you're going to be talking about? Your problems, because it's what's on your mind. When something happens in your life, you don't see the blessing. All you see is all the problems it's going to bring with it. Right? The pursuit for things warps your mind. Adam and Eve in the garden never desired things. They had all the earth given to them. They were in the very garden of God. They were just told to tend it. And what did they get to do? They got to enjoy it. They had everything that you could ever dream of. But after sin, all of a sudden, what do you find them looking for? Clothes. Something to cover you up. Something to make you look different than what you know you already are. What's the world doing? They're just changing wardrobe a whole bunch of times until they find something that'll fool other people into thinking that they are something. Until what? Somebody else comes by in a slicker pair of shoes. Or it's, it's, until somebody else comes by in a color that nobody's seen before. Oh, wow, isn't that cool? Then what? Everybody wants that color. It's a never-ending cycle. That's why all them fashions that you threw out about 30 years ago are coming back into style now, because people ran out of ideas. So they said, well, everybody threw that away. Let's bring that back so they got to buy it again. Right? That's why cars... Old-timey cars, right? They were meant to be futuristic. And then they're like, nah, let's make them more convenient. Now what is it? it looks like they're coming out of video games again. Why? Because they tried everything, and they're like, well, let's just go back to making them look like the future again. There's only so much you can do to satisfy an appetite or a desire that your flesh has. But it says that the sleep of a person that labors is sweet. But that word sweet, every time I think of sweet, I think of sweet tea because I don't drink it anymore because I put too much sugar in it when I used to make it and I didn't want diabetes. So I stopped drinking sugar so I could keep eating sugar. <laughs> so now I drink diet drinks so that I could still have sugar in food. Right, but sweet, something pleasant, something that you enjoy. So many things in the world, in nature, are not sweet. So many of the foods that you cook, if you'd cook them without seasoning or you'd cook them without dry rubs or anything else, it would not be sweet. You know what you find a lot of in the world when it comes to flavor palates? You got a lot of sour. You got a lot of salty. There are a lot of things that actually make you thirstier. All those potato chips that y'all eat 
right? You know what? A code of insult. So you got to go buy the soft drink by this company that owns the company that owns the potato chips. It's, they're trying to make you thirsty, so you go over there and get a drink. But also, the salt tastes good. Two birds, one stone. Well, they'll get hungry and they'll eat these chips and then they'll be thirsty and then we'll get twice the money. But so much of what's in the world will drive you to crave other things in the world. But yet the Bible talks about that John the Baptist, for an example, what he ate while he was out there in the wilderness clothed with camel hair. He ate locusts and what? Honey. Something sweet. Sweet will satisfy you. Sweet will scratch that itch that you've got. Oh, that hit the right spot. Why do you think desserts at the end of dinner? Right? To give you something that makes you, you know what? That's it. I'm done. I'm good. Because what? You already had an appetizer. You already had the main course. Right? You may have even had a salad in there that's rabbit food. Right? Give me something that I eat a salad, I'm hungry five minutes later. That's not food. Food satisfies. Food makes me not hungry anymore. What do you say? What do you end a fine meal with? Something sweet. Because you already had all of the other stuff that you wanted and what? Still had room for a little bit more. Why was that? You hadn't had anything sweet yet. Well, it says that the sleep of a man that labors is sweet it satisfies him when he lays his head down on his pillow and he's getting ready to go to sleep he knows I've earned this but also everything that happened today I know I did what I was supposed to we think of that word labor and we think oh no that's, a, that's, a, that's somebody that goes out and they dig ditches No, we've already told you what laboring is there's a whole bunch of different types of labor when it comes for the labor of the Lord, most of the time labor is done inside of a prayer closet on somebody's knees where they're not doing much physically. They're not exerting themselves too much mentally. What are they doing? They're just devoting time to God till they know that their petition has gotten through to God and that God said He's going to handle it. So much of labor is not effort or exertion, it's time. And we know time is money. People don't want to give up time because it means they're going to have to give up money. But if you go out and you labor, you'll be satisfied not with what you get in return, but knowing that you went out and you fulfilled the will of God that day. Spiritually, how many things in our life could we look at, put it on a shelf, and say, there's no good in that other than looking at it. That doesn't do me any good. In fact, the only thing that that does is take away some of my time. But I am willing to give up that time because of how that thing makes me feel. Well, if it was worth investing the time in, the feeling would last. I don't care who you are, don't care how old you are, don't care what it is that you go out and do. If you labor for a day, when the quitting time comes and the job's done, you could turn around and look at it and know, I did a good day's work. There's satisfaction in what you did. And if you come by the next day, you're still going to be just as satisfied because you know how much effort you put into it. In fact, the only time that that satisfaction wears off is when the world starts working on it and it gets dry rotted or it gets rusty or something happens to it. It don't last. But then what? You've got to redo it. But you're willing to put the effort in. Why? Because you know that what you're doing is going to pay off in the end. So much of spiritual labor, if you read in the Bible, you can't lay your hands on what it is that you're laboring for. Christ talked about the kingdom of heaven. You can't lay eyes on the kingdom of heaven. You can't grab a brick and lay it down in the streets of pure gold in heaven. In fact, everything in heaven was made by the Lord because of His love for you. You can't claim any of it. All that we, the Bible tells us, our labors will be 
when they're put through the fire of God's judgment, they'll be gold, silver, and precious gems. We find that because of our devotion to be laborers, that there's going to be a couple of crowns that you might be able to get. But see, the labor is not for what you get out of it. The labor is because you know you need to do it. If we were really interested in laboring for those things in heaven, we wouldn't do what it says we're going to do with all those riches. Lay them down at the feet of Jesus. But a laborer doesn't labor for something. He labors because he knows he needs to do something. If all of your spiritual labor was really for God to pat you on the back and say, hey, look at how much you did. You to hold on to it for all of eternity. That's a sign of saying, hey, this is how much my labor proved to be. You want to know why I know that those riches won't satisfy you? Because that's not what we're laboring for. That's what we were laboring for. We wouldn't lay them down at the feet of Jesus. The labor that provides that sweet sleep, that satisfaction, that peace deep down in your soul, you could stand before God and say, Lord, I gave it my all. From sun up to sun down, I gave you everything I had. I got recharged, and then we went and we did it again. Didn't matter if we was inside, if we was outside, if it was humid, or if you know it was in the middle of a downpour, whether we was out in the desert and it was hot and there was no you know, air in, or water in the air. Wherever it was that I found myself, I tried to give you everything that I had. You know why somebody does that? Because the reward is in the labor. It's not about what you get out of it. Right, the labor for the Lord, what does it call? The Bible call it a labor of love. You know why somebody will labor? Not everybody in here has a job. You know why I didn't say that everybody in here has a thing that they get to do for fun and get paid for? Because jobs are not fun. If they were fun, they wouldn't pay you to do it. You would pay them to be able to take part in it. You ever notice that? The things that are fun, you've got to pay to get it. The things that aren't fun, people pay you to do it. Right? And if you go to your job and you give everything that you've got while you're on the clock, which is very rare nowadays, but if you give everything you've got, you're either going to be mentally, physically, or emotionally exhausted by the time you clock out. Why would somebody in their right mind subject themselves to that day in and day out, five days a week? If you're lucky. If you're unlucky, seven days a week. If you're really unluckily working double seven days a week. Why would somebody do that? Because it's not about what they get out of it. It's because of what they love. You know why a father will spend time away from his wife and his kids? He'll go to work and maybe physically, emotionally, mentally, right, get himself to the breaking point every day. Because when he goes home and he sees his wife and his kids and the things that God's blessed him with because of his labor... He says, it's worth it because I love them. Doesn't labor for himself. If it was for himself, he wouldn't have to work eight hours a day. If it was for himself, he'd be able to not give 100%. But the people that he loves, they have needs and they have wants, and he wants to fulfill them. The Bible says our Heavenly Father is no different. He wants to bestow gifts on us, but you can only bestow upon those that labor. God doesn't give his riches to those that don't appreciate them, that would throw them by the wayside. God rewards the faithful. You know what you got to be in order to be faithful? A laborer. Didn't Jesus himself say that the fields are wide unto harvest, but the laborers are few? There was a lot of workers, there were very few laborers. People that would go out and treat it like their field and their crop and give it everything that they've got. Why? So that they could go home and they could sit down with their family and say, it was worth it. In fact, I'm going to go do it tomorrow. So that you don't have to go out and do this. Now, I know nowadays, 
it's almost impossible to you know, not live in a cardboard box with a family if only one person's got a job. I get it. But why do we go out and labor, man or woman? Not for what you're laboring for, it's because of what you love. The issue is, some people are just in love with the things that they can buy or get from their labor. Love of money is the root of all evil. Because that same desire for more money is the same desire that causes people to gather things to them that are no better than to just put on a shelf and look at. They'll never be able to use it, consume it. In a hundred lifetimes, they wouldn't be able to spend everything that they've amassed. But what's that desire for more? That's that love of something that they can't put a name on. It's a love of something that they, they can't even wrap their heads around it, but they're looking for something that will satisfy. And they think that money is the car that's going to get them to the destination. But people kill for money. People betray for money. Didn't Judas get 30 pieces of silver? People do all sorts of things for money. Why? Because they think that money is going to give them the answer to that deep hole in their soul. But we got a whole bunch of Christians today that are unsatisfied and spiritually they're in a whole heap of mess. Because they go out and they work. But they're not laboring. They're putting in the bare minimum effort just to get what they think they need so that they can go out and invest it in the world to try and scratch that itch that they've got. They'll never be satisfied. They'll never lay their head down on their pillow at night and say, Lord, today was a good day. Where that rest, where that relaxation is sweet. Because they're satisfied not in what they did. They're satisfied knowing that they went out and they acted on their love that day. Because you can't labor for the Lord without a love of the Lord in your heart. If you go out and labor not because you want to fill up a tally book on how many tracts that you've given out or you want to show off your pen on how many Sunday schools you've been in without missing a beat. I don't even, Who takes attendance around here? We're not interested in that. What are we interested in? Coming and hearing about the Lord because we love the Lord. Coming to worship the Lord, to express the love that we have for Him publicly, openly, among people, to testify the fact that He's my everything. Well, day in and day out, if your labor for the Lord is out of love, then you're really going to get something done. You show me a guy that loves everything that he's got at home, right, wife, children, family. You show me that guy that just wants to take care of their needs and make sure that they're happy, I'll show you the best worker in the whole plant. You show me a guy that's always talking about how his wife's a pain in the neck and about how his kids are driving them nuts, I'll show you somebody that spends the whole day talking and not working. How do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because some people are consumed with things and they find out that with more things there's more problems. They think that things are going to make their significant other happy. They think things are going to make their kids turn out the right way. I find that if you just love them and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, they're going to be okay. I find that if the Lord builds a household, that no man can undo it. That if the love of the Lord is the centerpiece of your home, earth can't shake it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's some people that are working. There's some people that are laboring. And the people that labor, they may not have as much as everybody else because it don't mean nothing to them. That in truth, none of us need cars. People survived a whole long time without them. In fact, without a car, you wouldn't have to pay for insurance, you wouldn't have to pay for gas, oil changes, tires, maintenance, all those things, but yet why do you want it? Because it makes life easier. Well, so many times we labor for things that we need, but really all they are is they're trying to prevent us from laboring. The world's trying to steal your love away so that you just go to working. Because you can work all day long and get nothing done. But if you labor, whether it's for an hour or whether it's from sun up to sundown, you're going to get something done while you labor. 
Labor implies that you are investing part of you into what you're doing. You only do that if you love it. You only do that if you may not love what you're having to do. Nobody loves repenting, but they love the fellowship that comes after it. You're willing to do things that you don't like, that you don't love, because it'll get you to what? The person that you love. But they say love and hate, two very similar emotions. Why is that? Because when you care about something that much, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. A lot of people hate their job because they like what they do. They just don't like the people they got to put up with while they do it. They loved the idea of their job until they found out who they stuck next to while they had to do it. But there's a lot of things in life that you can love for a moment, but you're going to find out you're going to hate it real quick when you find out how much time and effort and energy it takes you to hang on to it. They had so many things in people's lives or things that they're giving up so much of what could be invested in labor. Something that, in the long run, it will satisfy. That in the meantime, God's going to give you a space where you've got that sweet thing in your life that gives you satisfaction to go on another day. You've got peace and you've got joy. You've got a song deep down in the gable into your soul. You've got fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You know where that comes from? Labor. Because you've got to invest yourself into the things of God in order to get the sweetness out of the things of God. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.